In example one, we want to calculate the change of enthalpy of carbon dioxide as it undergoes the process from a temperature of 250 to 1200 Kelvin, assuming ideal gas behavior, using the following techniques. Our first technique is going to treat our constant pressure specific heat as a constant value taken from table A5. Then our second technique is to treat our constant pressure specific heat as a constant, and we're going to average it between 250 and 1200 Kelvin using table A6. Our third technique is going to be an integral averaging technique where we're going to evaluate the integral of CP0 between our temperature bounds, taken from table A6. Lastly, we will use values published on table A8. For us to begin and see why we are doing this, let us look at the behavior of our constant pressure specific heat as a function of temperature. We see, at 250 Kelvin, our constant pressure specific heat is a little below 0.8 kJ per kGk. And as our temperature increases, our specific heat monotonically increases up until 1200 Kelvin, where our constant pressure specific heat is equal to 1.30 kJ per kGk. Thus, our constant pressure specific heat has increased by 64% over our range of interest. That is, if we use a value published close to 300 Kelvin, we'd have very inaccurate results at elevated temperatures. Now, for us to begin, let us first treat our constant pressure specific heat taken as a constant value from table A5. Our change of enthalpy is simply our constant pressure specific heat times our change of temperature. That is H2 plus H1 would be equal to CP0, which is taken as 0.842 kJ per kGk times our change of temperature, 1200 minus 250 Kelvin. H2 plus H1 is 799.9 kJ per kg. And we should take this value with some skepticism. Now, if we take CP0 evaluated at 250 and 1200 Kelvin and average that value, we would expect to have a better prediction of our change of enthalpy. That is, using table A6, we can evaluate CP0 at 250 and 1200 Kelvin, recalling theta is equal to our temperature divided by 1000. Our CP0 evaluated at 250 Kelvin would be 0.79 kJ per kGk, and our CP0 evaluated at 1200 Kelvin would be equal to 1.3 kJ per kGk. Thus, our change of enthalpy can be expressed as 1.3 plus 0.79 per 2 kJ per kGk times our difference of temperature, 1250 minus 250 Kelvin. We'd have a value of 992.75 kJ per kg. We see this has increased nearly 25% in comparison to our result where we took CP0 as a constant. We'd expect to have better confidence with this result and it'd match experiment a little more closely because we did not assume a constant value that clearly wasn't constant over a range of temperature. Our third technique would be integrating CP0 between our bounds. We recall our change of enthalpy dH is equal to H2 plus H1, which would be equal to the integral from state 1 to state 2 of CP0 dt. Now recall theta is equal to our temperature divided by 1000, and we have to change our variables from temperature to theta. Thus dH would be equal to 1000 times the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of CP0 d theta. Therefore, our change of enthalpy is equal to 1000 times the quantity 0.45 theta plus 1.67 divided by 2 theta squared minus 1.27 divided by 3 theta cubed plus 0.39 divided by 4 theta to the fourth evaluated between theta 1, which is equal to 0.25, and theta 2, which is equal to 1.2. Now note C0, C1, C2, and C3 have values of 0.45, 1.67, minus 1.27 and 0.39 respectively. Our change of enthalpy is equal to 1054.6 kJ per kg. Lastly, if we calculate our change of enthalpy from table A8, all we have to do is take our enthalpy evaluate at 1200 Kelvin, plus our enthalpy evaluate at 250 Kelvin. And we'd have 1223.34 minus 173.44 kJ per kg or our change of enthalpy between state two and state one is equal to 1049.9 kJ per kg. This value is very close to what we calculated by evaluating our integral of CP0 between our bounds. 